Welcome to this introduction to Poisson probabilities. We'll look at the Poisson probability equation, its mathematical assumptions, and a few examples of applications. First things first though, this distribution is named after Simeon Denis Poisson, so it shouldn't be confused with the English word poison or the French word poisson, which means fish. The Poisson distribution comes from the binomial, and it's a special case of the binomial under certain circumstances. If you're familiar with the binomial, you'll remember that it describes the probability of seeing x successes in n trials when the success probability is p, and is given by the equation p of x equals n choose x times the probability of success to the x power times the probability of failure to the n minus x power. If you don't remember this, you can watch our binomial probability videos on this same channel and playlist. It turns out that when the number of trials gets large and the probability gets small, as a rule of thumb, when n is greater than 100 and n times p is less than 10, the binomial probability equation simplifies into the Poisson probability equation. This equation gives the probability of seeing x successes as the mean number of successes raised to the power x times e raised to the power negative mean divided by x factorial. The two equations shown are for when you have either the population mean or are using a sample mean to calculate your probability. If we look at the Poisson probability equation, we can see that it doesn't have the number of trials or probability of each trial directly in it. Unlike the binomial, which required a set number of trials and a known probability for each trial, the Poisson does not. Poisson probabilities are used for the probability of seeing x events or successes in an area or over a set period of time when we know the mean number of observations or successes. The potential number of observations can be huge and even unknowable, so the binomial is not appropriate, but the mean number of observations is often easier to determine. As mentioned, one typical scenario is calculating the probability of seeing a certain number of events in a given area. For example, if we know the average number of snails per square meter is 3, and we're looking at a particular square meter, what are the odds of seeing none at all? Another typical scenario would be when we're interested in the probability of seeing events over a set period of time. For example, if we know the average number of deaths in a retirement home is 5 per month, what are the odds of seeing 10? The Poisson probability has three important assumptions. First, the events occur randomly with respect to one another. This assumption comes directly from the binomial distribution independence assumption. Second, the events are relatively rare. This is what allows us to replace the binomial equation with the Poisson equation. Third, the probability of occurrence doesn't change over time. This assumption comes directly from the binomial distribution's assumption of constant probability. In fact, one way to think about the Poisson distribution is as the limit of the binomial distribution as the probability of each event goes to zero and the number of trials goes to infinity. The Poisson distribution has an incredibly useful property whereby the mean of the distribution is mathematically equal to its variance. The entire distribution can therefore be specified with one value. This is useful because this relationship can be used to test hypotheses about whether a distribution we observe is due to Poisson, that is random, processes or not. If it is, then the mean should be equal to the variance. This is usually tested using the coefficient of dispersion, represented by the equation to the right, where the coefficient of dispersion is equal to the variance, divided by the mean, and we're usually interested in whether it's equal to 1 or not. Let's look in more detail at the coefficient of dispersion and what it can tell us. It's equal to the variance divided by the mean, and a Poisson distribution would have a coefficient of dispersion of 1. The top figure shows a Poisson distribution with the coefficient of dispersion equal to 1. If the variance is less than the mean, then the coefficient of dispersion is less than 1, and we term the distribution underdispersed or uniform. If we think about what that means in terms of numbers of observations, we see more samples with a number of observations closer to the mean than we expect, and fewer samples with numbers of observations far from the mean. The numbers of successes in our samples are more consistent and similar to each other, which would look like the middle figure. There we see that most of the samples have 3 or 4 or 5 observations, and very few have 2 or less or 7 or more. If the variance is more than the mean, then the coefficient of dispersion is larger than 1, and we turn the distribution over dispersed or clumped. If we think about what that means in terms of numbers of observations, we see fewer samples with a number of observations closer to the mean than we expect, and more samples with numbers of observations far from the mean.
the number of successes in our samples are not as consistent as we would expect if they were random, which would look like the bottom figure. There we see that the samples have a wider range of successes than predicted from a random process. Another way of visualizing this is to think about what this would look like for our observations in space or time. The middle figure shows a random distribution of individuals in the square and a random distribution of events along a timeline. We would get a coefficient of dispersion of 1 if we analyze the numbers of individuals in randomly chosen areas and the number of events in randomly chosen time periods. The left figure shows a very non-random distribution of individuals or events where they are essentially equally spaced. The numbers of individuals in each region or events per time are much more consistent than we would expect from random processes and we term this underdispersed or uniform. The right figure shows a very non-random distribution of individuals or events where they're separated into clusters. The numbers of individuals in each region or events per time are much less consistent than we would expect from random processes and we term this over-dispersed or clumped. Another useful property of the Poisson distribution is that consecutive Poisson probabilities are related to each other. If you look at our equation for the probability, we can separate out a mean in the numerator and the value of x in the denominator and bring that out to the front. This would leave the mean raised to one fewer power in the numerator and the factorial of x minus 1 in the denominator. But the second part of that equation would be the Poisson probability for x minus 1 observations. Therefore, the Poisson probability for x is equal to the mean divided by x times the Poisson probability for x minus 1. For example, let's think about if the mean was equal to 3. If the mean is equal to 3, then the probability of seeing one occurrence is 3 raised to the first power times e to the negative 3 divided by 1 factorial which would be 0.1494. The probability of seeing two occurrences is 3 raised to the second power times e to the negative 3 divided by 2 factorial, which would be 0.2240. But if we use our relationship described previously, the Poisson probability for 2 should be equal to the mean divided by 2 multiplied by the Poisson probability for 1. This is equal to 3 divided by 2 times the Poisson probability for 1, which is equal to 3 divided by 2 times 0.1494, which is in fact equal to 0.2240. Okay, so what applications do we have for the Poisson probability? One application is that if we know that a process is random and we have a mean, then we can predict the probabilities and proportions of numbers or observations. We could then go and measure the numbers of individuals in certain areas to determine whether they are located randomly or due to non-random factors. This sort of thing is done all the time in field ecology, for example, where scientists lay out transects and count the number of individuals in each region. And it's not just for geographic locations that we can look at Poisson probabilities. We can look at events over time as well. If we know that a process is random and we have a mean, we can predict probabilities of numbers of events over time. For example, at the time this video is being made, COVID-19 is a brand new virus still in the early stages of a global pandemic. At this time, not much is known about this virus, in particular, how it may be changing over time and why. The figure shown is a phylogeny, a diagram indicating the ancestry and relatedness of different strains of COVID in different countries. The small circles indicate times when the genetic sequence of that strain changed. A very important question is whether those genetic changes are just occurring randomly, or whether they are occurring non-randomly in response to natural selection. Is there evidence that these genetic changes are because of non-random processes, like improving its transmissibility or changing its lethality? Or are these changes just random genetic drift? We can estimate the mean number of changes we see per amount of time, and use that to create predictions for how many changes we expect to see, and compare them to observations for the number of changes we do see. The Poisson probability therefore provides us with a tool that we can use to better understand the evolution of a deadly disease. For a final application, we can think about one of the scenarios I mentioned at the very beginning of the video. For example, we expect to see a certain number of deaths each month in a nursing home. The rate of deaths over time should be constant, and the deaths should be independent of one another, which would allow us to use the Poisson probability to predict how often we should see different numbers of people dying each month. When there is a month with what seems like an unusually high number of deaths, we can use the Poisson to figure out whether it's something we would expect due to random chance, or whether there is evidence that there is a non-random factor 
like a murderer, in the nursing home. Comparing unusually large values or apparent patterns to our expectations from randomness has wide application. For example, the SETI project, a project looking for extraterrestrial life, uses the same sort of procedures. When they see unusual patterns in their signals, they don't instantly get excited. They compare them to how often they would expect to see unusual patterns coming from space. Having a mathematical and unbiased way of analyzing unusual events is important if we want to make sure we don't get misled. The human brain is hardwired to overinterpret noise as pattern and respond emotionally to rare events. Having an approach like the Poisson allows us to mathematically determine whether what we see is genuinely unusual or what we should expect to see from time to time. Feel free to randomly press a button to show your appreciation.